Oh, hi. Welcome back to Let's Talk Retail, PRA's podcast, award-winning podcast. Right? And just like that, it's already April. One quarter has passed already. And so many challenges in the first quarter. So today, we bring you back Let's Talk Retail. Now, we are on Spotify. And you know the drill. Click the button to subscribe to YouTube. Now, we're entering a new chapter, and our guest today is also entering a new chapter in his career. And he will enlighten us on the road to recovery. We are on alert level one already, and hopefully we will get to the post-pandemic world that we are all hoping for. He's the newly minted COO of one of the country's successful brands, which serves as the world's best French fries. And today I have Tara Fries. But before we dive into our exclusive interview, as I said earlier, don't forget to subscribe. It's such a great learning tool. We're on YouTube and we are on Spotify. Now let me introduce our guest. He started off in hospitality. Okay, he has more than 38 years of uh, transnational experience. He was in the Mandarin Oriental and in the Palace Hotel in Beijing, in uh, operations, general management, and he has been working also in franchising. He entered the food business, franchising, business development, and strategic planning. Recently, there was big news about Potato Corner. Long time, long time. You see them everywhere. Okay? And there was big news. It's an undisputed uh, leader in the kiosk-based fry segment in the Philippines. And would you believe they have 1,250 stores spread across 14 countries? That's a global brand already. And it's further deepening into key markets, building on its strong equity among both consumers and franchises and delivering industry-leading margins for its stakeholders. Prior to our guest appointment, he was a vice president for international operations, business unit head for franchise store operations, as well as director for franchise and business development of Shakey's Pizza Asia Ventures, SPAVI, planning and business director of Shakey's Philippines. It is a publicly traded corporation. So he has also been in key roles in other F&B companies, as I told you earlier, and those F&B companies are Tokyo, Tokyo, Mr. Donut, Red River, McDonald's, Philippines. Ladies and gentlemen, please meet our friend, Mr. Joey Altero. Hi. Hi, hi, everyone. Hi, CJ. Hi, Joey. Nice to see you again. Nice to reconnect. Okay. Same here. Same here. Yeah. Okay, Joey, let's start off first with you. Um, You finished in UP and you were in the college of? Home economics. For what uh, course? Hotel and restaurant uh, administration. I think it's a different course yeah. name now, no? Yeah, they changed it. But it, back then it was HRA. Yes. And you went to the, what was your first job? Uh, right after, actually, I was still in practicum, CJ, uh, at the Mandarin Oriental. And then I was asked to join as a front office receptionist. So that was my first job. And then uh, I, I, from front office receptionist, I moved on to become to become an executive butler. So during that time, uh, all these uh, five star uh, hotels were looking into um, having more service oriented people that will differentiate them from the other chain. So that's it. I I became a butler, and then I moved on to become guest service manager for the Mandarin. And then when there was an opportunity to be a member of the Palace Hotel in Beijing uh, opening team, uh, I also went there. So I stayed there for four years. So, Joey, is it good to start from the bottom? What is the advantage of that? Uh, Personally, I would say yes, because it allowed me to um, move up the ladder. So now, in in, uh, the position that I am occupying, I am able to better relate to people uh, on the ground, those that are near to the guests or the customers. So I could share my personal experiences on how to deal with them. And I think that's that uh, sets the tone or better allows the people to understand the ultimate objective of uh, delighting or uh, uh, delivering the guest uh, experience that you'd like to achieve. The guest experience, we'll go back to that later because after Palace Hotel, you found yourself already in F&B, right? That's right. That's right. Tell us about your journey through the F&B mar- uh, industry. 
Okay, so from from uh, Beijing, I went back to Manila. I I took on a consultancy job, still with the hotel and restaurant industry. And then one of my former work colleagues was working at the McDonald's uh, Corporation. He was a VP for uh, operations. Can I mention names? Or sure, of course, they are friends. <laughs> uh, uh, hi, Bobby Lopez. So Bobby Lopez asked me to join no, uh, McDonald's. So at first I was uh, reluctant because I was telling him uh, my my background is hotel hospitality right. just to please the guests. So he said no, but it's also the same. The objective is to please your guests. And here lang in in McDonald's there. You do it in the store rather than doing it in the hotel. So I joined McDonald's in uh, true enough uh, hospitality or FMB industry. As long as you know what your objective is, and that is to delight or please your your guest, then uh, everything else follows. So in my journey from the hotel to McDonald's to Red Ribbon to uh, Mr. Donut, and now moving to the Spavi Group, no, uh, Shakey's in Potato Corner. It's all the same. As long as you know uh, what your main uh, objective is in, in, in our line of uh, business in the retail, it's to uh, exceed your guest expectation. So if that's clear to you and you don't veer away from that, uh, whether, yeah, hotelier or uh, restaurateur, then it's all the same. And I'm glad you brought that up because you can you made an easy transition because it's always about the customer experience. That's true. That's true. I agree. That was very clear to you. Okay, so now you you been you were in Shakey's in the Shakey's group, and the pandemic hit twenty four months ago. How was how did how did you cope with the pandemic as a as your, on a personal level, and then later we talk about the company. Okay. On a, on a personal level, no? uh, if I may share, no, CJ? Yes, please. Uh, from a personal and a professional level, I think uh, it would be the same for me because when it set in last March uh, 2020, we were all, no? we were all taken aback uh, because of that Black Swan event. No? So uh, we didn't know what to do. But uh, what's important is that, uh, first of all, of course, we do. We, we, we pray, no? We ask for guidance. And uh, as we went along, we, we reviewed, no? On a personal note, how, how we're going to cope, uh, you know, is something that's uh, unchartered, but you don't have to panic. And at the same time, for business, we did the same, no? So for me, I came up with, uh, with uh, some acronyms, no? What I use. Right. Uh, sure. So, uh, uh, Shake is, as you know, is a very, very uh, robust company. You know? uh, our president and CEO, uh, Vic Gregorio, yes. came back in 2003. Uh, he also rose from the ranks, huh? CJ. He used to be a waiter. So one of the reasons why I joined Shake is actually is because I wanted to work with him. Uh, for me, he's one of the, we say, the main GOAT, greatest of all time, for me in the, in the FMB industry. Because he was the one who steered the uh, Shake East to double digit growth, right. uh, both top line and bottom line for 16 straight years. And we were on our way to again, uh, hitting double digit for 2020, but then the pandemic set in. So we would always go into huddles, no? daily. We had daily huddles with the top management, including our uh, owners. No? So we would uh, huddle and say, how do we cope with this? Uh, it's a good thing that um, Shakey's already had a very strong delivery platform. So, uh, but, but we were also hit hard. We were also hit hard because a lot of our stores uh, had to close. But then we looked at it. And then uh, for me personally, I looked at it and came up with the uh, six uh, guide points. So one, when we were looking at how to best serve our guests, F, they were looking for something familiar to them. Right. C, something uh, affordable, more of value for money. Okay. See something that was convenient. Uh, we would be able to serve them when they want it, where they want it, and what they wanted. E, you should be empathetic. Uh, you are able to provide solutions. You're not just a transaction. Uh, you solve problems to them, and they know that uh, you are putting yourself in the place. 
right? Of course, we're in the food, so it should be something that uh, fits their taste profile, something that they like. And the added uh, uh, factor to that is would be safety. So when we put that all together, I think we're better able to pivot and manage our guest expectations. And that allowed us to uh, have our head above water during the pandemic. You mentioned a favorite word of ours, pivot. Yeah, it's, it's overused, but that, that's really how we had to do it. No? We, we just had to have our, in basketball, kasi ganun yun, di ba? you have to have your pivot foot, foot firmly planted that you're able to really uh, move around. And that's what we did. That's Curiously, every crisis has, is an opportunity. Okay, and every crisis yes. is a learning. So on those two questions, what was the learning and what were the opportunities? Yeah. On the pandemic for the Shakey's group. Yeah. The learning is that for the Shakey's group is that um, during that time, we discovered that, of course, everyone saw that cash is king. All right. So you should be able to, to have a, a big uh, kitty to make sure that you're able to continue your, your, your business. Um, opportunity, because there were a lot of other uh, players who were not able to provide what they wanted to provide. It is sad. It is sad, actually, because uh, some other uh, players uh, did not have enough resources to continue with that. So that was the opportunity part of it. So we, we made sure that uh, during those times, we helped our franchisees by helping them manage their uh, cash flow position. So uh, how did we do that? We made sure that, uh, and I, I'm sure all the other players did this, we helped them manage their uh, PNLs. We, we looked at their manning, uh, manning guides. How can we best uh, go with the staffing requirements in the stores, which will not compromise your quality, service, cleanliness, and hospitality standards. We talked to lessors such as your good self, no? We requested that uh, we're in this together. We've been partners for a long time. And I think this is the time that we were able to test the value of that relationship with the uh, lesser such. So thank you also for providing us uh, assistance no? uh, during that time. So that, that's uh, what happened. Uh, we were able to keep ourselves afloat. We were very meticulous in, uh, in uh, managing our, our cash without really sacrificing uh, standards and also looking after our uh, teammates, the people in, in the organization. So as we enter an almost pandemic, uh, pre-pandemic world, okay, do you carry these learnings with you? Of course, of course. So now we are uh, better uh, prepared in case there would be some other uh, uh, situations similar to this one, then we've also we've already developed a, a playbook. Uh, it's it's not a, a perfect playbook, but I would say we would be better able to respond to uh, certain uh, situations already. We will be guided because we've already, uh, as I said, we, we we meet every day, so we're very agile. We do stand up meetings, uh, just quick meetings, uh, CJ, uh, 15, 30 minutes, okay. and then we go out and, and deal with, with the, the situation. So I think we will be better equipped um, looking at the store, looking at the brand, and looking at our people. Because those are the three pillars of growth that uh, the SPAVI group uh, always uh, looks into, uh, the brand, the people, and the store. And we've come up with uh, specific uh, action plans and strategies on how to deal with uh, situations if and when they arise. Another favorite word is playbook. I remember we, when we had Stephen Tan of SM Supermalls uh, as our guest, he said there's no playbook for this crisis. That's true. That's true. I was in the first almost, uh, almost a year into the crisis, the pandemic. So now I guess everybody has a playbook of some sort. Yes, they, uh, I think, and we can share. I think we can share. Uh, we talk a lot. We, uh, we benchmark. We, we uh, ask people that we work with, like your good selves, the lessors, and other players in, in the industry, and how did they cope. And then we, we listen to podcasts such as your good self is uh, 
Well, broad, thank you. and we learn a lot. We learn yeah. a lot. Yeah. So, um, Joey, during a crisis, what are the personality types or the characteristics of people that will that you notice, observe, that got through the crisis well, the pandemic? Oh, okay. So first, uh, people again in our culture, we talk about. You already know this the wow culture. Okay. So wow culture is uh, uh, is something that's uh, ingrained in all the people in in, uh, in in our organization, and that's always consistently uh, exceeding guest expectations. So that's uh, something that's expected of us. And as I mentioned earlier uh, at the start, if you know your why, I always say this: if you know your why it will be easy to find your way. So uh, I don't remember who, who said that, but I always use that. And uh, as an organization, we're very uh, keen in making sure that uh, we stick to that mantra. And I think if, you're, if you set out, again, to uh, uh, exceed expectation of guests, if you have that resolve, and uh, it will be easier for you to be uh, agile, it will be easy for you to pivot to what the guest needs. Because if, if you see that they are requesting for something or asking for something, which you believe you will be able to provide uh, within, within uh, reasonable uh, means or within ethical means, then we all uh, in, in SPAVI go out and uh, uh, support and, uh, everyone so that we can achieve that objective of uh, Wowing our guests. Wowing our guests. Now, you've been an industry, one of the industry uh, participants for many years. In the crisis, as an observer, what do you think was done right by other FNB or even other non FNB um, brands? And what did they do wrong? Okay, as an observer, let's okay. say first what they've done right. I think what, uh, what, uh, a lot, a lot of the retailers uh, did uh, during during the pandemic was to make sure that they knew what their uh, targeted publics would be expecting of them. So uh, key was communicating to them. You had to be truthful. You had to declare what uh, we can do and what we cannot do. And I think uh, the people were able to understand the situation of their favorite restaurant, their their favorite shop that they will not be able to uh, do that. And I think that was important. As I mentioned earlier, as long as those we uh, establishments and uh, uh, companies were able to show empathy, they were able to uh, be with this uh, targeted guest and uh, customers, then uh, I think they were able to come across well. Uh, I think those who failed would be the ones who kept to themselves and uh, were more transactional. Uh, okay. They were looking after how could they could uh, uh, best uh, manage just the costs without looking at uh, really managing the relationship with their uh, guests and customers in the long run. So that's my take on that. So okay. that means you have to take a more long-term view. Yes. Uh, it's like taking uh, uh, one step backward and yeah. steps forward. Uh, everyone took a hit. So I think a lot of companies lost money, but uh, uh, they had a strong result that we, they will be able to get through the crisis if they uh, have the belief that they will be coming out strong out of the, as you said, in every crisis, there's an opportunity. So those people who looked at it more of an opportunity rather than a situation wherein they will suck, then I think that's what uh, differentiated those who were successful during the pandemic versus those who were just uh, uh, there in the sidelines. Panicking. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. Panic. But it was, but it was, I know, it was uh, really something that we didn't expect. So at the start, oh. everyone was really scrambling, uh, even us we scrambling. So we really had to, to uh, regroup and make sure that we uh, had a hold of the situation. And that's why we, as I mentioned, we met up every day to make sure that uh, we knew 
moving forward that uh, we will be doing meaningful and purposeful uh, action plans. What was harder, 2020 or 2021, and why? Uh, I would say it was uh, 2020 because we were really not prepared. Uh, we took uh, a big hit in 2020, but then uh, we were able to steady our sales, so to speak, towards the end. And I think, uh, modesty aside, Spabi was one of those uh, brands which had a net uh, even score in terms of stores that opened versus stores that closed. So our net score was zero. Yeah. We did, um, uh, the number of stores we opened was equal to numbers of stores that we closed. So we didn't go under in terms of uh, total store count. And I think that's because we were, as I said, uh, even top management and the owners were really on top of the situation every day. So that allowed us to better prepare for 2021. And again, I'm proud to share uh, that uh, for 2021, we opened uh, the most number of stores wow. uh, for the company. So even during the pandemic times, we were able to uh, uh, open stores and that's because also we've already we already have the discipline of uh, looking at each store opening as something that should add value to the company so so yeah that's something that uh, we were able to do um, thanks, up there and thanks to the team i'm very curious because you know, as a mall developer i've seen the closure of stores but i also have seen the stores that were brave hearts, they would go on and open new stores or strengthen their current positions. So in the case of Spavi, what was fueling this expansion in the midst of 2021's portion of the pandemic? Yeah, because we saw as again, we go back in every crisis, there is an opportunity as you mentioned. So we saw that um, we had a lot of uh, leeway in coming up with different store models. Right. So we, we took advantage of that. So if you would look, we had uh, we opened uh, Peri Peri stores, which were smaller in uh, footprint. Uh, we came up with new uh, store models like the we we had the Delco uh, delivery and carry out. We we increased our number of stores. We also had Del Dico delivery Del dine Dico. in and carry out small dine in uh, mm -hmm. uh, stores. No? So. This allowed us to be present in uh, trade areas where uh, there's a demand for our products. So uh, our investment was uh, not that uh, high and we're still able to meet our payback targets. So uh, of course that came uh, about uh, CD because we also had a lot of uh, offers from lessers like your good sales. And again, we're able to get a uh, very good uh, Great, so that, that allowed. Kind of but, but it's a it's a win win win. No? Yeah. So that allowed us to uh, serve the guests. Uh, that allowed us to uh, serve you. Uh, continue the partnership with lessers right. and our franchisees, and also good for the company because we were able to uh, expand the brand presence. So the pivot was the opportunity to experiment in four formats that's aligned to the market's realities. Yes, because as I said, when we look, looked at the facets, uh, what would be right. convenient for the guests, right. so where they want the products to be served, right. and what, so yeah, if they, they're asking for delivery, uh, the delivery channel in their areas, then we provide you delivery. If you'd like carry out, we provide you carry out. Uh, in areas where there are limited dine-in capacities and uh, we would be allowed to open there, then we, we open there. So that's how we were able to uh, uh, get through 2021 and open the most number of stores. Yes, I, and I saw standalones, more standalones or shakies, gasoline station shakies. I mean, that's a part. Yes. Uh, especially in the provinces, we opened our ah. big boxes. Yeah, yeah. So in the, in, uh, in the expansion strategy, it's either you penetrate, you saturate, or you dominate. So based on our expansion plans, we, we opened the store that uh, uh, fits the trade area that uh, we're looking. So that allowed us to, as I said, uh, open uh, a lot of stores still. Uh, still on the open lots of stores. 
was it more Metro Manila or more provincial? Uh, it was more provincial because uh, uh, some of those that we opened uh, were already being planned before right. but did not materialize. So when the pandemic uh, came in, although there were challenges logistically in bringing in uh, materials, we still uh, pushed through, although the schedules were pushed back a little. But most of them would be in the, the provinces, although we are still underrepresented. In ah, the so where do you see growth coming in from uh, April 2022 onwards? Uh, I would still say uh, for, for us, it's still going to be uh, outside of uh, Metro Manila. Specific so in areas? The of, uh, I'm sorry? Specific areas. Southern Tagalog, um, Visayas. So. Uh, we're still uh, under index in Bismin. So we're going to, to uh, look that way for, for uh, SPAVI. Uh, yeah. And then for uh, Peri Peri, we were still uh, looking at Metro Manila because we haven't saturated uh, Metro Manila yet. Okay, so we talked about the, crit the criteria for people who succeed in the crisis, okay? Now, a favorite of my, a personal favorite of mine is uh, the intergenerational question. <laughs> the two of us are baby boomers, but you and I know that there are more than just baby boomers in the workforce. You have three generations, baby boomers, um, Gen X, Gen Y, the millennials, and the Gen Z, actually four already. So as a leader, how do you now work with all of these four generations, especially during a crisis? Yeah, so that's very, I don't know, that's very exciting. Is it based on my experience? Yes. Uh, a healthy organizational culture and then your values and working uh, philosophy should transcend, transcend the different generations that uh, we work one. with. Yep. Uh, and, and I think that that uh, came into life now, no? as you said, there are four generations that uh, are working all together. Now, 30 years ago, tayo lang yun. Ano pala yung <laughs> generation natin yan. No? So, it is very important to onboard the teams early on, on your culture and your philosophy. So, as I mentioned, as long as everyone is on board on what, what, what the wow culture is, no? what our wow culture is, then... Uh, I think uh, that made it easier for uh, inter uh, generations to work together. Uh, in meetings, uh, everyone has a say in, in what, because all, all, all over, eh. uh, the young people are more, ano, eh, are more articulate in what they want. They're, they're really right. very passionate. No? They're very passionate. But uh, at the end of the day, it's always a collective, uh, robust discussion of what needs to be done. And uh, at the end of the day, yeah, uh, there are no uh, clear uh, divisions, whether you're a millennial, you're an alpha, you're a, a baby Again, boomer. Yeah, or, and, and, boomer, yeah. 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 Because you're, you're, you're united under the culture and the philosophy that your brand represents. So I think that makes it easier. That's not, that has not been an issue for me and for the company because we make sure that we blend all together. And they're in, we're all on the same page. And your owners, the paws are a young group. I mean, relatively. The same, yes, yes, the my, my yeah. Yes, they're they're uh, very young. Oh, just a question. How is it? How is it to work for a publicly traded corporation, but with the owners, the founders still there, actively working? In the case of the the Poe brothers. Well, uh. Actually, it's very, uh, it, it gives you a deeper sense of uh, accomplishment in knowing that the owners themselves are immersed. As I said, uh, they join our daily huddles and it gives you a sense of accomplishment. It gives you a deeper uh, sense of uh, a pride no? that when you do something and it works out well, you know that there's already a buy-in of the owners. And uh, they allow you, they empower you to, to uh, do what's right, again, within uh, what's, what's allowed. And that has allowed us to thrive uh, during these times. Uh, they're very supportive of uh, what we do or what we have done out there. Yeah. And the reason I ask that is, um, of course, when we look at the retail industry, a lot of them are still family-owned corporations. That's right. That's right. And yeah. there's now a move to start looking at uh, bringing professional managers. 
right? And but you know also that prof- as professional managers, they're cert- they're used, especially from the multinationals, they're used to a certain rigor and a certain uh, compartmentalized movement, you know, and a certain kind of drill down and a certain flexibility. So how do you marry that now when you have an owner still there and then you have your professional managers coming in? Your thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, in, in my previous uh, uh, stints, no, I've, I've seen that we're in a, it's a family-owned corporation and uh, their desire to professionalize the the company when when it's at the start it's really a struggle because as you said they're uh, balancing uh, priorities and activities no priorities meaning uh, do we work on uh, relationships or do we work on uh, the financial side of things so it's always uh, a merry blend of uh, doing things no but the way i see it uh, personally and uh, i got this from uh, i'm not sure if you uh I've heard about this that in in the, the way you do things, there's always constancy of uh, your purpose. Then you should be gentle with your people and always mindful of your performance target. So constant gentle pressure. Uh, I read that somewhere. So nice constant gentle. You, yeah, you cannot have just constancy of uh, of your purpose and then uh, ask for delivery of performance results without taking care of your people because your people will leave. It cannot be constant uh, uh, pressure on your people because your your uh, business will die. It cannot just be uh, taking care of people and meeting targets and then not mindful of the why the brand exists so the brand, brand will disappear. So it's always a three-legged thing. Uh, constancy of purpose, uh, gentleness with your people, and uh, performance. So constant gentle pressure. And I think uh, when uh, owners are able to transition to this mindset, and then that makes it easier for them to be uh, more uh, adept and uh, ready in managing the business from a bigger overarching uh, perspective. We'd like your advice, like to seek your advice for two things. The first one is talking to second and third generation members of retailing families or family owned, in family-owned corporations. What's your advice? Should they go straight to the business from school or should they go out first and work somewhere here? Or what? That's our first advice-seeking question. For me, in, in my honest opinion, I think... Early on, they should have an inkling or idea of what their business is all about. Uh, perhaps spend uh, summers, no? But then uh, right after graduation, I suggest that they go outside so that they will experience how it is. And then they come back. So they would have a, a different set of lens when they come in. And uh, in my opinion, that will allow right. to be better prepared to uh, take on the challenge of uh, leading their organization uh, later on. Okay. Our second um, advice seeking question will be professional managers like you and me. Some some of our, li- our viewers are on a journey. So would you advise them to move out of the MNCs into retail and family-owned corporations? And what's good about that one? Well, uh, again, in my opinion, as I mentioned earlier, yeah. if you know your why, it will be easy to find your way. So if you believe that your your uh, your calling or your advocacy in life is really all about, because now at this stage, at our age, CJ, it's more of paying it forward. So right. I, look back, I look back who were the mentors that I right. had. No? So now I'd like to pay it forward and make sure that I train people and uh, share with them what I've learned through the years. No? So I think for me, no, uh, if the opportunity presents itself, whether it's a multinational corporation or family-owned corporation, as long as your role or what you'd like to accomplish is clear, and that is to, uh, again, uh, we're, we're in the retail industry, so we're a daily business. No? We're in every peso counts. And if you're able to help the owners, whether that's a multinational corporation or as a family-owned corporation in 
maintaining again things in an effective way, in an uh, efficient way, and in an ethical way, then I think we have su succeeded. Effective meaning, as you heard, uh, doing the right things, efficient, doing things right, and ethically doing the right things right. So as long as you get all those things uh, uh, aligned, then for me, it doesn't matter whether you're working for a multinational or for a family-owned corporation. All right, thank you for that. Now, let's go to something exciting. The, pur the purchase of Potato Corner, which used to be owned by Mr. Magsay and Mr. Renat, yes? And, yeah. Um, Purchase, but that was the buzz of the fourth quarter, 2021, in the midst of the crisis. We have a buyout. Okay, um, what made Spavi look at Potato Corner? What is it about this this heritage brand that made very interesting for you to buy? Well, as as I mentioned uh, earlier as well, no CJ, uh, Spavi is all about wowing. No? So our vision in Spavi is to have a roster of wow brands uh, with strong brand equity, uh, ability to scale, and uh, industry-leading margins. And uh, when we look at the uh, Potato Corner, it ticked all the boxes. No, It is uh, convenient, uh, high quality, and accessible, a very accessible food option with a strong brand equity among right. both consumers and uh, entrepreneurs. So that said, when we were looking at it, it's really a very margin accretive business, asset like, and um, has a very high EBIT in earnings before yes. threatened taxes. So, Sempre, uh, we will also be better able to maximize multiple operating synergies, no? as being part of uh, Century and SPAVI, uh, looking at our competence in business development, franchise management in uh, supply chain operations. So we feel that we have the organization to take it to the next step. Uh, and uh, of course, kudos to the previous owners, as you mentioned, no? uh, Jose, Joe Magmagsaysay, and the Hernandez family, because they were able to bring it at this level. So uh, it, it's a very uh, strong brand. Uh, there's a very uh, uh, Iconic, no? Iconic feel to the brand. And it's very strong. It's very strong. And it also gives you a sense of national pride. Because eh? it's a homegrown brand and it's present already in 14 territories. So, parang when you go abroad and you see that there's a potato corner, it gives you a sense of pride. Wow, that's a Filipino store. And uh, I'm proud that we have presence in this uh, corner or certain uh, part of the world. And I asked the question because to inspire our our members and our listeners about the possibilities of expanding and then being bought out later on, right? That's part of their growth strategy. Yes, yes. Uh, so for for those, everything starts with the first store, diba? With one store. So always dream big. Dream big. Uh, you can attain everything if you put your heart and mind into it. Everyone starts with the first store. But here is the reality check. What are the challenges now of the transition from two owners now integrating it into a publicly traded corporation? Are there yeah, any when, yeah. When, concerns? When, when we were when we were doing the due diligence, of course that that came up. No, when you, ano magiging challenges natin? No? So right. first would be maintaining the brand uh, relevance. No, uh, SPABI, the SPABI board in management recognizes or recognize the importance of uh, the brand relevance. No? So as I mentioned also earlier, we'd like to make sure that we will be able to continue investing in the brand, investing in the people, and investing in the store, in the business. No? So during the pandemic, uh, Potato Corner was hard hit like any other brand. No? And with a significant decline in uh, food tra traffic in spaces we had location. So the challenge now is to ramp up the recovery, bounce back, and reopen in uh, locations that uh, were closed. Uh, number two, uh, the second challenge is for us to be able to maintain the strong performance. Sorry, strong performance versus competition. No, uh, the perception is that, ay simple lang ang operations ng ano ng uh, potato. Yeah. Madaling gayahin yan, madaling gayahin. Pili ka lang ng 
ng patatas, tapos bili ka ng powder, pwede ka na. No? Pwede ka na. So, the challenge for us now is to protect the deterrence to those perceived low barriers, which are pieces developed retail footprint. As you mentioned already, we have over 1,250 stores spread uh, here and uh, abroad. Uh, we also have a very good franchise management um, a playbook, which has been followed already you know, for the past so many years, and good personal management. So I think that allows us to uh, hold the fourth versus uh, competition. No? And then third, of course, as in any uh, purchase, no? CJ, the challenge is to manage the integration. Right. Uh, there's always a risk uh, that the acquirer or the buyer in an M&A deal will have to uh, deal with during the transition period. No? So over the years, uh, the acquisitions which Spavi uh, had closed, we were able to already develop a very strong framework on how to manage this integration through a strong cross-functional team. So we already have a team to look at how we'll be able to uh, manage this. No? But it still remains as a challenge. So now uh, it's time for us to further identify uh, opportunities on the possible high-impact enhancements and synergies that would allow us to uh, have these uh, uh, plans come into fruition or materialize soon. Okay, last two questions. Okay, given all these changes in your career and your company, what keeps you up at night? Well, uh, the challenge of being uh, assigned no, to steer this company to <laughs> greater heights. No, so uh, that's why I'm very thankful to the SPAVI board no, and to my boss, he, uh, Dick Gregorio, for giving right. this opportunity. And uh, that keeps me at, uh, awake at night because it's a very, as I said, it's a very iconic brand. And we know that uh, the former owner owners in Joman already have set a very high bar. And uh, that's the challenge for me and that keeps me up at night. So. Uh, yeah, God willing, and uh, with the help of my teammates, we'll be able to uh, get through that challenge. And my last question is, what's your forecast, Crystal Ball, what's your forecast for April 2022 onwards to December 2022? What do you see from where you're sitting? Uh, in, for the retail industry, I think uh, the opening up of the economy you know, bodes well. Uh, we're seeing now people going back to the malls. Uh, people, uh, yeah, going around. So I think from a business standpoint, uh, 2022, barring any other uh, resurgence no, of the uh, virus, would uh, allow us to be on our way back to uh, pre-pandemic levels, uh, which is 2019. So we have to be prepared as well to uh, serve the needs of our guests and our customers. So it's time to sit down with the uh, Lessors once again, like CJ. <laughs> <and then, laughs> so allow us a little more uh, time to uh, be back on track. And then uh, for the suppliers as well, no, uh, uh, we have to talk to them and tell them, uh, okay, we're seeing already uh, uh, a road back to where we were before, but let's always sit down. Let's, let's talk and see how we could uh, uh, continue our partnership. But I think it's going to be on the way back to uh, 2019 uh, levels, specifically for for, right. for clients. But we are also cautiously optimistic. We, we do not like to uh, overpredict that uh, things will be very, very good. But uh, we're setting our, our sights on uh, being at that level by uh, year end. So God willing, uh, We'll be able to have a happier, a fun-filled uh, December this year. Very optimistic. And thank you so much, Joey, for sharing. Thank you as well. Thank you. Earnings for Potato Corner. And we wish you more power as Pavi brings Potato Corner to greater heights. With you and the help. Thank you, CJ. And thank you, PRA, for uh, the opportunity to share what's Pavi and uh, Potato Corner uh, we'll be doing 
for the coming days and the uh, days ahead. And I will see you in the mall soon with Vic. Say hello to him, and I hope. Yeah, you- yeah, we'll we'll, we'll uh, pay a visit, CJ. I'll yes, have uh, yes. Vic come with me there. Okay. All right, and with Leo also the po- the po- siblings. Please send our regards. Thank you so much, <laughs> Joey, for spending time with us. And ladies and gentlemen, that was Joey Alvaro, the new limited CEO of Potato Corner, and we hope you learned a lot from the insights he has shared with us today. And you know the drill: just click and subscribe. To YouTube, YouTube channel of PRA, and we're also on Spotify. This is CJ Hasena wishing you a good day. Let's talk retail, the PRA multi-awarded podcast, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you.